So we've been working our way through Acts, um, and this isn't for any dramatic reason. I was praying about other things this morning and just forgot to go get my mic, so I'm going to try to pin myself in place this morning. Um, we've been working our way through Acts, and the, the Spirit-led uh, message and prayer of uh, Ethan during communion is a great synopsis of Acts. It's a bunch of people sitting around going, we didn't take the steps, we didn't do the things. If we're honest with each other, we're not really going to be great at doing the things in the future. And while they're having these conversations, the Holy Spirit interrupts them and comes in anyway. It's the story of the book of Acts. The, the unrelenting uh, power of the Holy Spirit. And we'll continue that. You can, you can turn there. Uh, we're we're going to be in Acts chapter 20 today. Um, to give us a, a, a brief opening here, it has been a wild and crazy uh, year and a half. Things have changed and, and evolved, and we have um, found new opportunities and, and new ways to, to gather and to reach people, as Ray was talking about this morning. Uh, we have this morning, uh, if... if um, if, if what's been happening kind of holds for the last six weeks or so that we've been able to kind of look at it, we've been blessed to have our, our online family uh, very large, to have a larger online family than, than what we get to meet in person. And so, you know, this is, we, we encourage you all and, and continue to, to, to download the Highland View Church app for what that offers us now, but for more things coming in the future, and as Ray was talking about and Emily was talking about, things are constantly being added in new ways to meet and gather. All that said, we have some exciting things. Our, our numbers are dropping uh, rapidly in, in our little community here in our area in East Tennessee, in Tennessee as a whole, in our nation as a whole, our COVID-19 numbers are dropping rapidly. Uh, we, we have good signs. Now, we, we, we know we've been here before, and, but what we do and what we've done in the past and what we want to continue to do is we want to prepare for the best and understand that we don't have a whole lot of control. And so our, our, our goal has been painstakingly through sleepless nights decisions to do everything we can to keep everyone as safe as possible, uh, even when it's not what any of us would love to have. We'd love to have all of us gathered right here together, literally uh, as close as possible doing everything in person, but we have prioritized keeping everyone as safe as possible. We have good news with the kids' vaccines coming out from 5 to 11 uh, at even a higher efficacy rate and coming hopefully soon. That, that carrot on a stick has been dangled for quite a while, but it looks like we are getting to a place where in the next few weeks that will become a reality. Things are looking up. And so what we are going to prayerfully do is prepare for a greater return to in-person activities, a greater return to us getting to gather those who are able to gather here in the building in person, a greater return to being in each other's physical proximity and lives outside of this building, in small groups and in classes. A return the first of the year is kind of what we're looking for is the first of January, kind of when we kind of re-kick off things normally as a leaping off point is what we're hoping for. And again, we realize nothing is in mine or the elders or anyone else's control, but we're going to prepare for the best 
and pray for the best. We're hoping to return, even in, in January, I was talking to a couple of the teens this morning. There's Look Up Lodge has a, we have missed Look Up Lodge deeply. That has been one of the things that, that the, the teen group has missed the most. Uh, it, it has been this amazing space for us for several years now at several times. There's a Look Up Lodge teen uh, camp in January. It's Martin Luther King Jr. weekend. We're looking at that as being able to go and take a group and have this return. So our, our plan is we, we really do watch this every day, as many of you do as well. We meet every week for a, most of the time, every other week sometimes. We, we bring in uh, Gail Rubright as, our, as, as an expert to come in and, and offer advice as well and insight that we don't have. And we are doing everything that we can and so we're excited to look to the future as numbers continue to come down, as vaccines become more prevalent, as the boosters are out, as the kids vaccine is seemingly on its way soon, that the beginning of the year, we can have a greater return to events and to in-person things. So we're excited about that. That's kind of just a quick synopsis of where we are and where we hope to be Heading, so we want to just continue in prayer for that. We want to continue in prayer for that. Uh, Acts so far, started to walk, can't walk. Uh, Acts so far, uh, the, the prevailing theme of everything is the Holy Spirit. And, and, and I would argue, and, and I really hope you read in, that, that going one step further is... I'm going to use a strange word for it, but the audacity of the Holy Spirit to come in and, and take both Jew and new believers, new followers of the way by surprise. To do things seemingly out of order and, and not the way that we, they thought like this would typically go. The uncontainable, uncontrollable nature of the Holy Spirit. The voice that hovered over the deep in Genesis, that Holy Spirit, and the power that has come with the arrival of the Holy Spirit poured out to all. We have Saul and Paul, again, same person, not some big dramatic like shift with, you know, Paul got saved and he changed his name. But like many of them, they use different names depending on where they were, a Roman name and a Jewish name and different things. We have Saul and Paul, and we have all the stories encapsulated there. And, and Saul is a, a primary focus for the rest of the book of Acts. It's what Paul is doing within the Holy Spirit and how that walk looks. Now, Luke, who wrote Luke, Luke, who wrote Acts, draws similarities, and they're really, really starting to come out. Uh, chapters 19 through the end and 28. Something else I want you to see, it, it's just literary work, but it's really beautiful, is that Luke, as the author, draws these parallels between Paul's journey, Paul's belief, Paul's suffering, and Jesus's. And, and it is not in any way to equate Paul with Jesus. Paul makes that point over and over and over again. The point is Paul, that is Paul made in his messages, and that Luke is showing just in literary style, is that Paul says, listen, the closer you mimic Jesus, the more your life and your walk is going to look like the life and the walk that Jesus had. That there, there's no equating Paul to Jesus. The point is Paul has married Jesus. They have, they have married, they have bonded, and Paul's walk and Paul's following of Jesus in the exact same crowds with the exact same judges and the exact same Jewish leaders is now resulting in Paul's journey looking a lot like Jesus. In this section here in chapter 20 and 21, all through the Gospels, we see Jesus is constantly on the move towards Jerusalem. Now, now Jesus went in and out of Jerusalem many times over his ministry, over his life. 
But we see there towards the end, Jesus always has his eyes towards Jerusalem. Luke draws us to that with Paul. Paul has been, uh, Paul has not made a lot of friends in the Jewish leadership. We've seen over and over again, it says the Jewish leaders were, um, most of the time, jealous is the word it uses. And the Jewish leaders stir people up to run Paul off. And the Jewish leaders have Paul beaten, and the Jewish leaders have Paul thrown out of the city, and all of this over and over and over again. A lot of this stemming from Paul doing those things when he was in Jerusalem. Paul was the one in Jerusalem wielding the whip, wielding the stone, wielding the sentence of followers of Jesus. Paul comes back to his home base at Antioch, and he goes out and back on these missionary journeys, the three of them. And the worst place for Paul to go is Jerusalem. But the church in Jerusalem is suffering. Famine and different things have gone on, and Paul has been out and he's been collecting money from the other churches on his missionary journey to take back, kind of to, you know, home base, to take back to Jerusalem. And there's a lot to this. He, he's drawing these Gentile people into collecting and, and contributing money to the Jewish community in Jerusalem who's following Jesus. And he's also showing that church in Jerusalem, hey, they mean it. They mean it. Now, anyone could have delivered that money. But Paul refused for it to be anyone but him. Even though plot after plot comes up where he has to change direction and change how he travels because the Holy Spirit warns him of a plot, of a, basically an assassination plot, and he's got to kind of swerve in different directions, and yet he knows his eyes are on his return to Jerusalem. So let's look at chapter 20. <clears throat> chapter 20 starts out. After the uproar ceased, now remember the uproar was that, that riot uh, that had occurred in the town where at the end of it people were walking around and, and it makes the point that most of the people didn't even know why they were there. That riot is what we're talking about. After that uproar had ceased, Paul sent for the disciples. And after encouraging them, he said farewell and he departed for Macedonia. When he had gone through those regions and had given them much encouragement, he came to Greece. And there he spent three months. And when the plot was made against him by the Jewish leaders, uh, side note, your translation probably says Jews. Uh, most of the time when you see you in the New Testament, we've talked about this, it's y'all most of the time. Uh, most of the time when you see men in the New Testament, and, and it, you'll have a footnote. The footnote will, will say, like, most of the time, that is men and women. If it doesn't have an asterisk or a footnote in most translations, there's something specific to it, and it means men. Uh, most of the time, when it says Jews and talking about uh, Paul's interaction with them, when it says the Jews were jealous or the Jews rose people up against him, most of the time it means the Jewish leadership of wherever he is. So the Jewish leaders, the Jewish elders, uh, a plot had been made against him by them. As he was about to set sail for Syria, so he decided to return instead on land through Macedonia. Some sort of plot on the ship was to occur, and so he got redirected. Uh, skip down a little bit, chapter 7. And as always, as I hope you did last week, and you went through and you read, same thing as we skip around, this is what's here for you this week to go back and read through and underline and, and make your notes and check these things. Uh, verse 7. <clears throat> On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them, intending to depart on the next day. And he prolonged his speech until midnight. Here's another one. The breaking of the bread is very ceremoniously indicative of 
the, the Eucharist, the, the Lord's Supper, communion. It's not always. And, and you'll have some commentators that say anytime it says break bread, it is. And, and you'll have some that says anytime it break bread, we don't know. The point is sharing a meal together was a sacred experience regardless. Most of the time when we use the, that language, the breaking of bread, most of the time it is communion. So here we have, they've gathered on the first day of the week. It's in the evening. Uh, this was a, a normal, you know, work day. And so at the, at the end of the day, they, they gathered that evening and Paul had prolonged his speech. At this point, we're probably somewhere, at, at this point already, we're probably somewhere about six hours in to Paul's sermon. Prolonged his speech is a bit of an understatement. This is the, uh, the one about uh, the little boy uh, the, and the family that visits a new church. And the little boy was kind of rambunctious and, and running around. And so the, the preacher took it upon himself, you know, before to go meet the little boy and talk. And so they would, were running around the auditorium. And, and in, in, in one of these little breezeways and entryways here like we've got, there were plaques on the wall um, for people in the church who had, had, had died in the military. They had these plaques on the wall. And so the little boy said, he's like, what are, what, are, what, are, what are all these? And the preacher says, he's like, well, these are people who, um, the little boy's running around, bouncing around, dancing while he's asking. And he's like, well, these are people who died in, in the service. And the little boy stops. He said, was it the first service or the second service? And this, is, this is what's happening. This is the cues that Paul is getting from his room. There are many lamps in the upper room where we were gathered. And a young man named Eutychus, sitting at the window, sank into a deep sleep as Paul talked even longer. And being overcome by sleep, he fell out from the third story window and died. We had this really dark moment that is very intentionally set up as dark humor. Of you, lit you, you have this young man, you have this young man, young, sitting in the window. Paul has been talking so long at this point. And as Peter points out uh, later in, in Peter's work, listen guys, sometimes Paul's hard to follow. And so this, this young guy is sitting there and Paul is trying to, like, he knows that he's not coming back. And so this is the swan song, right? Paul's trying to fit in year of all, everything he knows into this one farewell sermon, and this poor kid just can't anymore, and he falls out the window from Paul's sermon that has put him to sleep. But Paul went down, <laughs> bent over him, and taking him in his arms, looks up at the third floor, you know, and he says, don't be alarmed, it's fine. His life is now back in him. And the kid comes back. The young man comes back. And you have this moment, and then Paul turns, and he walks back upstairs to the third floor, back to the crowd, breaks bread. It's now the next day. I mean, we, we've passed midnight, so we're not even past, like, like, we're into the next day. It's now Monday when Paul actually takes that time after this, after this young man has fallen out of the window because he fell asleep. Then they break the bread and they share it. They ate and then it says, and then Paul conversed with them a long while more until daybreak. So we're now somewhere in the 12 hour plus range of this sermon from Paul that he's delivered. And, and, and even Luke in the writing interjects the story of the boy and, and the point, yes, like you, you have this, this guy literally fall out and die and become raised, but it, it, it's, it's like a side note. They then immediately go back in, they break the bread and Paul just goes right on continues his sermon
At daybreak they departed, and the crowd took the youth away alive, and were not just a little comforted. Verse 16. Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he might not have to spend time in Asia there, for he was hastening to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. This is just a transition into our next piece here. But it's important to see that, again, Paul has his eyes on Jerusalem. And Paul, like most of the early disciples, hadn't stopped following their religious customs. It shows that they spent day after day after day in in the temple, in the synagogues. It shows that they, they went and followed the times of traditional prayer, the traditional times of prayer. It shows that they would have gone through the bathing to get into the temple. They would have been in these places. It shows here Paul is trying to get to Jerusalem to make that pilgrimage that many of them did for Pentecost to get to there where it all started to celebrate that day. And he's not stopping in Ephesus because if you have read or studied Ephesians, you know there's a lot there. And Paul knew that if he went there, he would never get to leave. He'd be stuck there for so long there would be no way that he would ever make it to Jerusalem. So he's trying to sail around to avoid this church that he loves, because we all have. You have friends and family like that. You're like, you'd love to see them, but you know if you stop by, you'll just never get away. And this is how Paul is describing this. Go to verse 18. <coughs> Excuse me. This is big. So Paul has sent word instead to some elders, some leaders from the church at Ephesus. And they have met him kind of on the way. They've, they've intersected. And so here we have this really unique sermon. Paul has delivered tons of sermons that we even get to read about and get to see. There are two, and we read about him. He's in synagogues. He's trying to convince Jewish people of Jesus. He, he's trying to, to argue through sound logic and reasoning of Jesus. He's, he's talking to unbelievers. He's talking to a, a, a new place. He's trying to plant a church. All of these things. Here we have the first and one occurrence, really, of this message that he is delivering to Christian leaders. This is a whole different vibe. This is a whole different message to a whole different group of people. These are followers and not just that, these are leaders of the followers. And so we have this very unique message to leaders of the church. And it's one of his last ones. And it starts in verse 18. He says, again, talking to leaders of churches that he has planted, Paul himself. You yourselves know how I have lived among you the whole time for the first day that I set foot in Asia. Serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jewish leaders. How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house. Making the point, look, preaching to you in public is, is not fortuitous for my health. Like I, I, have, I have not shied away from preaching to dangerous people or in dangerous places. Uh, declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God, of changing your mind about who God is, and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, period. Change of direction. And now, behold, I am going to Jerusalem. I, I, I am prompted, I am prodded, I am directed, I am constrained. Whatever your, uh, whatever your interpretation may say, Paul is making the point like, this isn't just my decision. 
the Holy Spirit has made it abundantly clear. The Holy Spirit is drawing me, pushing me, pulling me, moving me towards Jerusalem. I am constrained by the Holy Spirit to make that travel, not knowing what will happen to me when I get there. The only thing I know is that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every single city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account, and this is actually an accounting term here. He is talking about money. He's saying, you know, I have, I've used the scales. I've weighed it out, and I don't find my life of any value. I don't find it precious to myself. What I find is that I am to finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. That's what I count as value. When I weigh getting to tell people about the grace of God versus my life, the scales are tipped. And it, there's not a decision to be made. What is important is that I get to tell people about the grace of God. That good news. Verse 25, we change again. And now, behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will ever see me again. He says, like, this, this is it. I, I don't know what awaits me, but I know I'm, I'm not getting out of it. I know I'm not coming back. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I'm innocent of the blood of all, for I didn't shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Again, addressing, this is the audience we're talking to. He's talking to leaders, preachers, pastors, elders. He says, pay attention, careful attention to yourselves and to all of the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained through Christ's blood. Verse 29. Verse 29, this is important. I know that after my death, after I'm gone, Paul, after I'm not here anymore, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. This is Paul's speech of, Listen, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not foolish enough to think that, that this isn't without hardship because we have no example of it being without hardship. But Paul's warning is specific. He says, you must pay attention to the wolves that arise from within. And, and it's not always the case, but most of the time in these scenarios... When we read the stories, when we read the accounts of the wolves within, the false prophets, all of these things, the antichrists, almost all of them had to do with money. Almost all of them were people out for personal financial gain. And, and Paul uses that knowledge that they're going to understand that to, to remind them, like, hey, remember, I wasn't here for that. He says, therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I didn't cease, night or day, to admonish everyone with tears. And now I commend you to God, I hand you over, and to the word of his gospel of grace, which is able to build you up and give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I, I, I didn't covet your silver or your gold or your apparel, your clothing. I, I wasn't after any of that. You yourselves know that these hands, my hands, I ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. In all things, I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, he's like, this isn't me. It's my message that I'm conveying, but we got to remember this is what Jesus said as the source, he himself, it is more blessed to give than to receive. So many of our, our bumper stickers and our, our hand-stitched quilts and our t-shirts are filled with Bible verses that don't exist. This one does. This one's real. 
It is, in fact, Jesus says, better to give than to receive. That's how he ends it. That's the end of his sermon to the elders. Be careful. I'm not coming back, and I know that in my absence, things will get hard. Pay close attention to yourselves, overseers, and then pay careful attention to your flock. And he reminds us, it is so, so, so easy for us to circle the wagons and look out and point all the fingers out, wherever out is. That part's easy. He says, but remember, remember the, the wolves often come from within. And in every one of Paul's letters, the wolves are the same. They're the same people, and they have the same message. Return to bondage. Return to bondage. Put the chains back on. Draw the lines back. Make new lines. Shackle yourselves more. He's like, remember what I have taught you. If it isn't good news, if it isn't freedom in Christ, it's a wolf. And then we have the closing. Verse 36 and 38. And when he had said these things, Paul knelt down and he prayed with them all. And there was much weeping on the part of all. And they embraced Paul and they kissed him being sorrowful most of all because of the word he had spoken that he would not that they would not see his face again and they accompanied him down to the ship this was you know for for those of us who uh traveled before 9 11 right you you would go through security with your family and, and you'd go to the window at the gate right and you'd watch them off and you'd wave aaron's Aaron's grandfather in Linden, he was a hard man. Uh, he, he was in World War II. His brothers were in World War II. Everyone on this creek that they lived in all served. And, and they had all been farmers before that and were farmers after. He was a hard man. And everyone knew exactly where they stood with him. And he was hard, except Aaron. <laughs> and Aaron, he was this like tiny little puppy. And so when Aaron would go visit, even when she was a, a teenager and I was there with them, when we would leave, he would stand on the front porch and he would wave his hand and he would not stop until the car had driven so far that it was completely out of sight. This is what this is like. These people have fallen with Paul he is a father figure, a grandfather figure, an elder of elders, a pastor of pastors, and he's just given them this news, guys, I'm not, I'm not going to make it back. And they hug him and they weep and they, they kiss all over him as, as was custom and they, they, they followed him all the way to the ship and they, they, they got him on the boat and they stood at the shores and they watched him off. Paul's life imitating Jesus had made that type of impact. The point of this farewell and what it meant to so many people isn't, as, as again, as Ethan said, the, the point wasn't, wow, Paul was so amazing. No, 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 the, the point was, was that Paul had chosen a life and a walk in his marriage, which is the most used example that we have in Scripture of what we are supposed to have with God as spouse, he had chosen to walk that so single-mindedly that he looked like Jesus. He smelled like Jesus. What he did tasted like Jesus. And so even as just someone mirroring Jesus, getting a glimpse of Jesus was so powerful that they just wanted to soak it in to every last second. That's what we want to be. That's what we want to be. 
We want people to see a glimmer, a glimpse of Jesus in us. And if they see a glimmer or a glimpse, that they, you can't help but want more. And then just as Paul, Paul never then said, okay, you've seen the glimmer, you've seen the glimpse, you want more, come here. No, 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 he said, I, I, I know a guy. I know a guy. Because Paul knew what has happening right here was going to happen from the beginning. Paul knew eventually Paul would leave. Paul would die. It's like, but I, I know the Holy Spirit will be with you forever, everywhere, even until the end of the age. There is nowhere you can go to outrun the Holy Spirit. So our job is just to point in that direction. But in order for anyone to care where we're pointing, we've got to first look and sound and appear like the good news, like the freedom in Christ, like Jesus. Let's pray. God, thank you for this morning, for the time that we have to share. For all of our family gathered here in this place, around, around town, around the area, around the, the nation online, Father, for our family gathered. We pray that all of us can mimic you in such a way that people look on curiously. We, we, we pray, God, please, Holy Spirit, help us mimic you in such a way that people want to look closer and not turn away. Help us to be hands and feet of the good news of the freedom of Christ. Amen. As we close out this morning, as Mark's going to come and, and we'll sing praise and prayer with him. Offer your prayers there in, in where you stand. Uh, pray with your neighbor next to you. Walk across. Pray with someone on the other side. Whatever the Holy Spirit draws you to do this morning. If that's to come here, to come down and talk to somebody, to learn more about this, this Jesus, about the Jesus pointed to and, and talked about and taught about in, in these scriptures. If it's to be baptized for the first time, if it's to ask for prayer for loved ones, whatever that may be, we just invite you to do that during this time as we stand and we sing. Thank you.